Hey guys, welcome to Relatable. Happy Wednesday. We are continuing our four times a week. That is the new development of Relatable, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Thank you so much for listening so much that we have had to give you more content than before. And this is a great week to start giving you more content because there is so much to talk about. So last night, the Georgia election, guys, it did not go the way that Republicans Wanted it to, of course. I mean, this has been my focus since November, especially since it looked like Donald Trump uh, was going to lose the election uh, to focus on these Senate races in Georgia because of Democrats, as I've talked about before, control the White House, control the Senate and control the House of Representatives. There is no piece of radical legislation that they will not try to pass, Um, especially if they try to get rid of the filibuster. That means that there will only be a simple majority that needed to pass their legislation. Uh, The reason that that's a problem is because they've also said that they want to pack the Supreme Court, which means they would expand the Supreme Court to 13 seats instead of the the nine seats that there are right now. And they would uh, fill those additional four vacancies with liberal activist justices uh, so that they would control all branches of governments. They don't have to heed the Constitution at all. They can trample on your constitutional rights as a result of that, and absolutely no one will be able to stop them. Now, of course, living in a Republican state is a safeguard against these radical liberal policies like the Green New Deal, uh, like socialized health care, like the mandatory gun buyback program that Biden has promised, like the Equality Act. Uh, But it's going to be a tough go of it, especially if they pack the Supreme Court. It's almost like there's no recourse in a lot of cases. And so that's why this is scary. The so-called moderates and even the people who were, quote, lifelong Republicans that decided to vote for Democrats in the name of decency have no idea what they just did. You have no idea what they just did. It's it's very baffling to me that we can look across the country at every city that is run by progressives. I'm not just talking about Democrats, but true progressives and see how the city has deteriorated. And then for people to turn around and say, oh, let's keep electing those kinds of people like Warnock and Ossoff. And so if you look at Atlanta, if you look at Austin, if you look at Minneapolis, if you look at New York City, if you look at Seattle, if you look at Portland, if you look at uh, San Francisco, if you look at L.A., they have become less safe. The homelessness has increased. The violence has increased. The murder has increased. They have become less livable places under progressive leadership. It's not just a coincidence that all of these cities that are run by these pretty far left officials have been run to the ground. That's what progressive policies do. In the name of compassion, they promise handouts. They promise to do more for the people. And their policies have the exact opposite result as the intention of the policies, and yet people always vote based on stated intentions of politicians. And because Democratic and liberal talking points sound so good that, look, we're going to take care of the poor by giving them this. We're going to provide this program. We're going to fight for your rights by doing this. They don't think about the other end of that, that what's, what is that going to cost? Is it actually going to help the homeless community? Is this program actually going to help the poor? What has been the result of raising the minimum wage in other places? Is this going to help uh, the employment rate? Is this going to help, uh, you know, or or, or funding the school unions or the teachers unions, uh, giving more money to them or giving more money to the public school system? Has that actually resulted um, in, in, in good things for students? The answer is no. But people... Most people, unfortunately, all of us, left and right, are very superficial. We're very shallow. We don't think past what a politician tells us. We hear a a promise, we hear a guarantee, and we say, that sounds good, that sounds compassionate, that sounds sympathetic, and we're going to vote for that without actually thinking about what are the consequences going to be. If you look at the consequences of progressive policies in all the cities that I just listed, it's not good. People's lives are not better. That's why people are fleeing those cities and those states that are run by those far left politicians. Unfortunately, what happens is that those people flee California. They move to places like Colorado, which is now blue because of that, or they move to places like Nevada or Arizona, which are now at least purple because of that. They move to places uh, like Texas, which is probably going to go the direction of Georgia in a few years. Uh, people you know, from New York move down to Florida for those reasons, the failure of progressive policy. 
policies, the tax policies, especially in some cases, and they keep voting the way that they voted before because people vote based on conscience. People vote based on, like I said, the promises that they're given by politicians. People vote based on these social and cultural issues. And if you are a Democrat who thinks that Republicans hate poor people, that's what you've been told and that's what you believe. Or if you are a Democrat who um, you believe that, you know, Republicans hate the LGBTQ community and that they're taking away all of their rights or that they're going to force women to be in the handmaid's tale or whatever it is, then no matter, no matter who the Republican politician is, no matter who the candidate is on the right side, you're not going to vote for them. No matter how much you might have hated the Democrat politician uh, in the city that you fled from, it's very hard for Democrats who still hold those liberal social values and have believed the liberal talking points their entire adult lives to then vote Republican. And uh, so there is a disconnect there, obviously. And yet it's uh, you kind of understand when you understand how the voter works. I mean, it's the same thing when you think about some of the people um, in Appalachia, for example, they always vote Republican um, because of these cultural and social issues, even though it has been establishment Republicans in a lot of cases that have aided and abetted the outsourcing of jobs to China that has hurt these Appalachian communities uh, the most. And it's certainly it wouldn't be better for them to vote for Democrats either. But economically, these people in the middle of the country also haven't been helped out by the Republicans that they vote for. People vote based on what they see as these heart issues, as these social issues. Um, And so when we look at this Georgia election where Warnock has been declared the winner and Ossoff um, is looking, as I'm recording this right now, I'm recording this on Wednesday morning. You're listening to this probably on Wednesday afternoon. Um, It looks like uh, Purdue or Ossoff is also going to beat Purdue. Um, A lot of people are saying, oh, this is because Mitch McConnell refused to to approve the $2,000 checks in the stimulus bill the way that Josh Hawley and Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump said that they uh, said that they wanted the Senate to do. But I guarantee you that is not the reason why people, why Republicans did not vote for these Republican candidates in Georgia, because that is what happened. That was the big issue here. Um, is that unfortunately there was lower Republican turnout than there was on November 3rd, and there was really good Democratic turnout. Um, And I guarantee you that the reason why Republicans didn't turn out is probably not because of the lack of the $2,000 checks, because the people who did vote Republican voted for the reasons not not that the intellectuals on Twitter think that they care about, not that the populists on Twitter think that they care about, but for these cultural and social issues. They're thinking also about these constitutional issues. Most people who voted for Republicans in Georgia are thinking, I don't want Democrats to control Congress and the presidency. They're looking at, you know, I I want to protect my Second Amendment rights. I want to protect my religious liberty. I don't want my taxes to go up. I want there to, you know, I want the Trump pre-COVID economy. I want to protect my family. I want to protect my liberties. I don't like socialism. I don't like socialized health care. I want to keep my guns. Like Those are the issues that people are voting on. The Republicans that did go out and vote Republican in Georgia were voting on those issues. The people who didn't vote, I think there were a variety of factors at play here. And I got in trouble on Twitter for talking about this um, by the, the, the Trump stands who think that you cannot criticize Trump and like still be an American or still be a conservative or even still be a Christian. There are some people when I criticize Trump saying, wow, you've really you've lost your way and you are no longer like you're no longer a steward of God's truth anymore. I mean, your head is in your head is in the sand. Your head is in the sand. Uh, I voted for Donald Trump twice. And I guarantee you, I have convinced I convinced more people in 2020 to vote for Donald Trump than any of the people accusing me of being a a never Trumper did. I guarantee it. And yet there are people calling me a never Trumper because I said, I think one of the factors why Republicans had low turnout, especially in counties that really turned out for Trump on November 3rd, um, is partly, not completely, but partly because 
of uh, Trump's constant berating of Republican leadership in Georgia and convincing Georgian voters that you are disenfranchised, Republican voters, that you are disenfranchised, that the entire election was rigged and that uh, really your vote didn't count on November 3rd. Therefore, I think it's implied, at least if he didn't say this explicitly, that your vote is not going to count on January 5th. Um, as well. And people pushed back on me. I said, you know, I don't think that Trump really cares that much about the Senate races. I think he cares more about, you know, flipping Georgia for himself. And people got mad. They said, he held two rallies. What are you talking about? Uh, This has, you know, he, he definitely cared about the Senate. Well, if you watch the two rallies, he mostly talked about fraud. Like he mostly criticized Kemp. He mostly criticized Raffensperger, which he has every right to do. And uh, some of those criticisms and questions are certainly valid. I do think that there was probably some funny business that went on in some of the counties on November 3rd in Georgia. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't question those things uh, for January 5th either. But when you spend predominantly uh, your time on calling into question the legitimacy of Georgia's elections, yes, you are going to convince some people not to vote. I think some people, some Republicans didn't vote because they actually saw it as an act of fidelity to Trump, as a pledge of allegiance to Donald Trump that is saying, you know what, I'm going to resist the system. I'm going to resist the establishment. I'm going to resist what they think is the establishment neocon GOP that didn't do enough to fight for Donald Trump like Mitch McConnell, and I'm going to stay home. I definitely think that that played um, a part in Republicans staying home. As I've said from the beginning, you can have questions and concerns about the legitimacy of the election. I want an election with integrity, too, and I support the investigations into any claims of fraud. Of course, if it were Democrat or Republican, I would support uh, those investigations, whether or not it changes the outcome of the election in the way of Donald Trump. But one way to ensure, I said, ensure Republicans lose in Georgia is to just not vote. If Republicans turn out and they just dominate Democrats, it's going to be impossible for Democrats to win by fraud. But instead, uh, I actually think if you look at the campaign that Donald Trump and some other people ran in Georgia, um, questioning the leadership of Georgia and questioning the legitimacy of Georgia's elections. I think that Republicans actually turned out pretty well. A lot of Republicans did not listen to Donald Trump and did not listen to the people who uh, said that Georgians, I mean, uh, Trump didn't say that Georgians shouldn't vote, but some people in support of Trump were saying that Georgians shouldn't vote. So I think considering that, a lot of Georgians did not listen to that line of reasoning and went out and voted anyway. But I do think that Trump's rhetoric and his constant focus on Georgia as almost like the center of fraud absolutely had an effect. Um, I think that he could have been stronger in saying, okay, look, these are the problems I have with Georgia. These are the questions and concerns that I have. But I think he should have been also really, really strong and really emphatic about people going out and voting still. Now, that's a really contradictory message, I understand, um, to say, but um, it is important. I do think, I I stand by what I said on Twitter, I do think that Donald Trump is laser focused on his election and uh, what he wants to happen. I think that he would rather Georgia fall probably than people stop fighting uh, for him to win that state. If you look at what he has focused on over the past few weeks, he has focused on Georgia fraud, more than Pennsylvania fraud, more than Nevada, more than Arizona, more than any other uh, uh, state that has these allegations of fraud. He is focused on Georgia. I mean, the day before the election, He was posting things about the fraud in Georgia. His rally was focused on the fraud in Georgia and campaigning against Kemp and Raffensperger. And again, I'm not saying that some of that criticism isn't absolutely legitimate. He obviously has a right to say those things. But again, did it probably have a part effect on the result of the election and and Republican Georgians not turning out to vote? Yes, I absolutely think so. And just to give credit to the Democrats, like they have had their eyes on Georgia. They were laser focused on Georgia, not 
I mean, not for the presidency, and they weren't fighting the same battle, unfortunately, that Republicans were. Republicans were split between focusing on the presidency and focusing on the Senate. But um, Stacey Abrams led her coalition and led her people to make sure that voters got out to vote. And she especially focused on black voters in Georgia and Hispanic voters in Georgia turning out to vote. And they did. Black turnout in Georgia was phenomenal. And I think that Stacey Abrams' strategy was like, look, I know there are a lot more Democrats in Georgia than typically show up to vote. I think that she went into a lot of these urban communities, especially, and said, I'm going to make sure that all of these people vote. And historically, Republicans have ignored those communities. Republicans uh, have instead focused on the people that they think are guaranteed. And they've said, you know what, we're not even going to bother. I'm not saying necessarily that these campaigns completely ignore these communities, but Republicans in general historically have ignored these communities, haven't tried to reach out to these communities, um, haven't tried to change minds in these communities, but instead have allowed the Democrats to kind of expand their control and expand their influence, um, uh, really across all demographics, but especially in that demographic. And so we do have to give some credit where it's due to the Democrats who worked a really hard ground game. So we can't fully blame President Trump. I also think, by the way, if I'm saying that Donald Trump didn't really care that much about the Senate races, I also don't think Mitch McConnell probably cared that much about the Senate races. We didn't hear a lot from him either on this. Um, I think most people are concerned with their own power and their own elections. I think that's probably true. Like, I like a lot of what Governor Kemp does. I think that he has an awesome family. I don't think he's some kind of closet liberal or anything like that. But I think that, you know, he's concerned with his own self, too. Like, he is concerned with his own political career and his own power. Most people, Donald Trump included, are very self-interested when it comes to this kind of stuff. And I don't think Republicans uh, rally together enough to support Leffler and uh, Purdue. So I think that's part of the problem. I think that Democrats were extremely unified in that. I think Democrats probably did a better job of turning out the vote, um, especially in uh, Black and Hispanic communities that Republicans just aren't as good um, at reaching. And so you might see, like some people last night were seeing the numbers and they were like, oh no, I see that Leffler and Purdue are actually ahead. Why are you saying that Warren Warnock is going to win, or why are you, why are people calling the race for Warnock, or why are people saying that Ossoff is going to win? And so the way that these predictions work is that they're not just looking at the number of votes that have been tallied and the percentage of, of those votes that are going to a specific candidate. They're also looking at where votes have not been counted. So as I am speaking, we're looking at DeKalb County, Fulton County, and Chatham County, which Chatham County, my husband and all of his family is from Georgia. I originally pronounced Chatham and he corrected me. It is Chatham County. I did not realize that. Apparently it's like a British word, but I did know it's DeKalb because I used to live in Georgia too. And I remember that. So we're waiting on DeKalb and Fulton and uh, Chatham as I am speaking right now anyway. And those are all heavily Democratic uh, counties. And so when people are making these predictions about Warnock winning, about uh, Ossoff winning, they're looking at the number of votes that are actually needed for Leffler or Purdue to win. And then they are looking at the votes that have yet to be counted and what counties uh, they are coming from. And they're saying, OK, it either is possible for Purdue to make up his uh, to uh, keep his win or Leffler to keep her lead, um, or it's not based on the amount of votes that they are probably that each candidate is probably going to get. So that's how that works. That even if you saw for some reason last night that okay with eighty six percent and we've got Leffler at fifty one and we've got uh, Warnock at forty nine, but they already called the race for Warnock. That's because they knew that the counties that had yet to be counted uh, were going to go for Warnock. So. That is how that works. As I'm speaking right now, the New York Times um, is predicting very much so that Ossoff is going to win. It's very likely Ossoff, which is just crazy. I mean, these two candidates, as I've talked about a lot on this podcast, Ossoff and especially Warnock are terrible. Like they're terrible candidates. Uh, Warnock is, I mean, you cannot anymore, and maybe this is just a good thing, everyone in Georgia who said that they were voting for Trump or voting for Biden based on decency and based on morality and then went out and voted for Warnock, you lost it. 
you lost it. You lost any kind of upper hand you had because Warnock is uh, 10 times worse, the allegations against him, as the ones against Donald Trump. And I'm not saying we should dismiss allegations against Donald Trump and not care about them, but we're talking about a guy who is currently, not 25 years ago, currently being accused of abusing his wife. Currently, his wife is accusing him of being a sociopathic abuser. And we're talking about, about a guy who was arrested for trying to stop the investigation into child abuse uh, at the church camp that he was the head of when he was the pastor of that church. And I read the testimony of the guy who is now 30 when he was 12 years old. He had urine poured all over him and was forced to sleep outside. And apparently this happened to a lot of campers at the church camp uh, that he was, that Warnock was the head of. And he tried to stop the investigation into that and was actually arrested. So he's a child abuse enabler. He's an accused wife abuser. I mean, the, and not to mention all of his radical policy ideas. He thinks America needs to repent of whiteness, that police officers are thugs. He said that Jeremiah Wright's sermon, uh, God D America, was Christian preaching at its finest. He says that Marxism is fine. He has praised Fidel Castro. I mean, this is the most radical guy. He is radically pro-abortion. Um, he is pro all of the anti-religious liberty, pro-LGBTQ issues that you can possibly think of. And yet you had professing Christians in Georgia saying, yes, this is the guy that I'm voting for based on decency. I just have to think that most people don't even, they don't even know. They don't even know what issues he actually stands for. And so any moral high ground that you thought that you had voting for Biden, which I don't believe that you had in the first place, because also allegations against Biden were just as bad too, you definitely lost by voting for Warnock. And so uh, you don't have any moral right to turn around and to say to a Trump voter, how could you vote for this person who was accused of all of these things? You voted for Warnock. I mean, nasty, nasty swamp creature that is going to the swamp. And Ossoff is also a swamp creature. I mean, every bit as swampy as any other politician. And so um, this is going to be, you know, this is going to be tough stuff. This is going to be um, difficult, difficult for us to watch because there's going to be radical legislation that is going to be passed. Joe Manchin, um, and other moderate Democrats are going to have a very powerful and pressured position in the Senate to try to stop some of this stuff from happening because they realize that if they vote for some radical legislation like the Equality Act or to end the filibuster, to pack the Supreme Court, gun buyback program, socialized health care, the Green New Deal, then they're not going to get reelected by Joe Manchin, like West Virginians, for example. And so it's going to be a battle. And now is not the time for us to retreat. Like you might be thinking that, oh, there's nothing I can do anymore. I voted. I have convinced all the people I can convince. And now I'm just going to not pay attention. I'm just going to turn the news off and I'm not going to watch what's happening. Yeah, that's exactly what the media wants you to do. That's exactly what Democrats want you to do. They do not want you to be paying attention to the legislation that they're going to pass because they want to win in the midterms. Remember, Warnock has to run again and just two years. He doesn't get six years. He has to run again in just two years. And so he benefits from you not paying attention. Democrats always benefit from people uh, from people being uh, ignorant and apathetic. And so ensure that that's not you. We have to keep paying attention. We have to hold our elected officials accountable. We have to look at the policies that are being passed and what can be done in the areas that we live. Now, we can't get paranoid. We can't get obsessed over it. We can't uh, let it steal our joy. We can't pretend that our hope and our trust is resting on these politicians because thankfully they're not. Uh, it's not, but we do have to be paying attention and we have to push back where we can. The biggest thing is going to be the culture war. I mean, they are going to be as radicalized as ever to try to change the language, uh, to try to change the public opinion about abortion, about gender, about all of the issues that you hold dear. And you're going to have to hold the line. Regular Americans are going to have to hold the line. So that's where we are. Also today, we'll talk about tomorrow, the... Um, the the Congress and verifying the electoral revote or, or electoral votes and everything that's happening there. We talked about it yesterday. I explained that, but we'll talk about it more tomorrow as well. Okay, um, I know I spent a long time on that, but that's a really big story. We're going to quickly talk about two other stories. Kamala Harris saying that freedom was the only thing that she wanted. Yes, freedom with a W 
when she was a toddler. And then we are going to finish by talking about Christian rapper Lecrae. We'll be right back. Okay, guys, I got to talk to you about Built Bar. So Built Bar is a very healthy way to keep you full throughout the day. If you're trying to uh, tide yourself over between meals and you're looking for a healthy snack and you're like, okay, I probably need an alternative to like the flaming Hot Cheetos that you were eating or the Chick-fil-A fries that you were eating as a snack and you need something a little bit more substantial and healthy, then Built Bar is a great alternative to you or for you. Each bar contains only 110 to 160 calories, 60 to 20 grams of protein. So that's really going to keep you full and only three to five net carbs. Uh, candy bars and Built Bars taste very similar. And I can attest to that per- uh, personally. It has a very good texture. They're all chocolate. They're covered in real chocolate. You've got like peanut butter chocolate, raspberry chocolate. There's 18 different kinds of chocolate flavors and they're all really good. And so you can have a variety, but they're all going to have that same great taste and that same great texture. There's caramel brownie cookies and cream. So just a lot of good options for you, all covered in 100% chocolate. So let this be part of your New Year resolution to tide yourself over with healthier snacks. Go to BuiltBar.com. Use promo code RELATABLE to get 20% off your next order. Use promo code RELATABLE for 20% off your next order at BuiltBar.com. All right, I want to quickly talk about this Kamala Harris uh, Harris story because it's just funny. So she had she had an interview with Elle magazine, and it was this uh, very glowing story about her, about how wonderful her laugh is, and how she's a freedom fighter. And she tells this story about when she is a toddler. She was apparently at this protest, at this march with. Uh, her mom, and she was in a stroller. And, you know, strollers back then, she said, didn't really have very many safety features. And so she kept falling out of her stroller and she was fussing and she was whining about it. And her mom was like, Kamala, what's wrong? What do you need? And she looked up at her mom, according to her, and said, freedom. Now, now, the funny thing about this story, I mean, it's ridiculous on its face. It's absolutely farcical on its face. I guarantee you that it did not happen. And if it did happen, she doesn't remember it. Her mom probably didn't remember it and tell her about it. I mean, completely fake. And you know how I know it's fake is because it was almost verbatim lifted from a story that Martin Luther King told Playboy uh, back in the 1960s. In a 1965 interview published by Playboy, uh, Martin Luther King told a story about he uh, was at a, a march in Birmingham and a white policeman accosted um, a little girl, seven or eight years old, who was walking in a demonstration with her mother. And the policeman said to the little girl, apparently, according to Martin Luther King Jr., uh, what do you want? And she looked him straight in the eye and answered, feed him. And so this is a story that Kamala Harris heard and that she decided that not enough people knew the Martin Luther King story. Um And so she was going to tell it uh, as her own. I mean, it is just cringe to the max. And let me just also say that it's a very odd part of the story that she says that uh, she fell out of the stroller multiple times. And she said that her mom didn't notice (laughs) that she fell out of the stroller. No one noticed and that she was fussy. That's terrible parenting. You're saying you don't notice that your little toddler fell out of the stroller multiple times? And that you had to ask her what was wrong when she was complaining. I can't, I, I cannot even imagine that happening. Why would you tell that story? That's very embarrassing for a mother. If your toddler falls out of a stroller multiple times and you literally don't notice and you have to ask her what's wrong and she says, feed them. <laughs> it's just the most ridiculous thing. But of course, the media, the mainstream media is not going to call her out on this. Now, if Donald Trump or if... um. Melania did something like this or Ivanka did something like this, if Mike Pence did something like this, it would be everywhere. I mean, they would be lambasted. They would be mocked. It would be 
on every nightly news show. But of course, the media, they don't really care. They don't really care that she lifted this from Martin Luther King Jr., which is totally disrespectful, by the way. They don't care that she's lying about this because now all of a sudden she is this heroine that they bow down to, even though she wasn't even able to pull above 1% uh, in the presidential primary. But this is what we have to look forward to for the next few years. Uh, The media who pretended that they were heroes for covering Donald Trump in a way that every single one of their colleagues was covering, that they were going to get no legitimate pushback for, are now going to be covering Biden and Harris as if they are gods. There's not going to be any serious criticism of them. There's not going to be any serious coverage of them. So we can just look forward to these celebrity profiles that don't ask any kind of tough questions. And again, that is why it's so important for us to pay attention and for us to ask those tough questions. And I'm, you know, I'm very thankful for uh, the ability to be able to talk about this stuff on Twitter and for conservatives to be able to point this stuff out or else no one would know it. And that, of course, is why conservative voices are so often silenced. That is why Democrats especially are for censorship on social media because they don't want someone like me or any other conservative to be able to point out that, hey, Kamala Harris actually plagiarized that. Actually, that's not a real story and that's really offensive and it's really stupid and it's really dumb that the media won't actually call that out. Uh, They want to be the only voice. They want to be the only ones with the megaphone convincing people. But That, again, is why you are so important. It's why it's so important for all of us to actually dig into things rather than just believing headlines and believing these glowing reviews of people. Uh, It really is. It it really is crazy. Okay, that's really all I have to say about that. I just wanted you to be aware of the freedom story that that (laughs) that is what we're up against. Like, that's what we're going to be dealing with for the next few years. You're going to have to dig and dig and dig for the truth of what's going on in this administration. You're going to have to look into what the Justice Department is doing. You're going to have to look in to what Kamala Harris is advocating. You're going to have to look into the executive orders that are being pushed forward and the executive orders by Trump that are being rescinded. You're going to have to look into the legislation that is being pushed and then passed um, by a Democratic Congress. That is going to be your responsibility. That, of course, is my responsibility to help you uh, do that. But if you just rely on the media, if you just rely on the New York Times, if you just rely on L or Vanity Fair or Teen Vogue, hopefully that's not where you get your news, you're not going to get the truth. You're going to get ridiculous stuff like this. And the same was true for Trump. I mean, there were legitimate reasons to criticize Trump, but so much of the coverage was unfair. You can't let that dictate what you feel about a politician either. Unfortunately, it takes a lot of work to get to the truth, and the media is betting on most people staying apathetic and ignorant. Again, leftists always benefit from apathy and ignorance. Um, it's just it's just how it is. So you have to refuse to be that. All right, that's all I have to say on that. Now we are going to talk about our friend Lecrae. Okay, got to talk to you guys about ExpressVPN. You guys know they are one of my favorite sponsors. I use ExpressVPN on all of my devices to make sure that my data is protected. If you care about internet privacy, uh, if you care about protecting your devices, uh, either from hackers or these big tech corporations who are trying to get all of your information, then you need a VPN to protect that information. It is a simple app for your computer, your smartphone, that encrypts all of your network data. It tunnels it through a secure VPN server so that your ISP cannot see any of your internet activity. Uh, If you just think about how much of your life is on the internet and how much you would rather not be public, uh, you will realize how much you actually need that data protected and that is why ExpressVPN exists. And it does it all without slowing your connection. So I just have an app on my phone that I make sure is on. I've got the application on my computer. You don't have to do anything with it. It's really easy. You just download both of them. You create an account and it's running in the background and it doesn't slow anything down. So it's it's really great. Uh, so stop handing over your personal data to ISPs, internet service providers, and other tech giants who mine your activity and sell off your information. Protect yourself with the VPN that I trust to keep me private online. Visit expressvpn.com slash Allie. That's A-L-L-I-E. That is expressvpn.com slash Allie to get three extra months free. So really nothing to lose. Go to expressvpn.com slash Allie to get three extra months free. 
Go to expressvpn.com slash Allie to learn more. All right. I want to talk to you guys about something that you have been um, asking me about, and that is the Christian rapper Lecrae. So most of you are familiar. If you're like me, you listened to him a lot in the early 2000s, uh, you know, the 2010s era. Uh, when I was in college, all of my Christian friends knew Lecrae. We loved Lecrae, especially every guy that I knew loved Lecrae. Like, not just, oh yeah, listen to his music casually, but really, really loved him because he was a trailblazer, is a trailblazer in the scene of Christian rap. And he was supported and elevated and pushed forward by a lot of evangelical leaders because this guy was criticizing rap culture, but he was still using the same beats uh, that other rappers were using. He was talking about stuff that no one else was talking about. He was sharing the gospel uh, with a unique platform that other people in the contemporary Christian music realm, they weren't trying to do and they weren't willing to do. And so um, we have to respect Lecrae and what he and, and what he did. And he was one of the first people to do it. And uh, he was one of the best people to do it. And he really changed Christian music in a lot of ways. It takes a lot of bravery. Um a lot of boldness to say, I'm going to do this thing that I don't see anyone else doing. I don't know how people are going to receive it, but saying, hey, I believe in the gospel. Jesus has transformed my life, and I'm not just going to sing about it and you know play the piano and acoustic guitar about it. I'm going to rap about it. And you don't know how that's going to be received. You don't know if people are going to like it or if people are going to shut you off just because they don't like people talking fast and rhyming. Um, but he did that. And I have a lot of respect for that. And, um, you know, his music is still really good. Now, over the past few years, he has shifted in some of his public stances when it comes to things like social justice, when it comes to police brutality, especially in the past few months, he has been very vocal about his support for Black Lives Matter and Democratic politicians. Um, he actually gave a speech at a, a Warnock rally, and I'll, I'll play you a, a little bit of that. In a spirit of Dr. Martin Luther King, in the spirit of, you know, uh, uh, Andrew Young, I want to continue to remind us that we're free. We are free now to vote. So let's get out there and make sure we do that. Set me free. Let's get into it, man. So this was very, this was disappointing to me, not because I think that Christians can't disagree on politics, because we definitely can't. Like I've said many times, and I truly believe <laughs> that you don't have to be some big, uh, you know, Republican or Donald Trump fan in order to be a righteous Christian. Of course, I'm not the arbiter of that. And I don't think that your uh, allegiance to a particular politician uh, denotes how faithful you are as a Christian. But some things are theological and not political. So the support, while I don't think that you had to have voted for Leffler or Purdue to you know, prove that you're a faithful Christian. I do think that some things are called into question when you support a pro-abortion politician. That's not a political statement. That's a theological reality. Like that does have to do with your faith. That does have to do uh, with what you think about who the authority is of the heavens and the earth and what you think about his word. If you support a guy who has been outright against biblical the biblical definition of gender, the biblical definition of marriage, protecting life inside the womb, who was radical on all of these issues, especially when it comes to abortion and has taken hundreds of thousands of dollars from Planned Parenthood, the number one killer of black babies, then I do have to question your theological views. Now, I am not the person to say, um, you know, I'm, I, I can't damn anyone's soul to hell, nor do I want to have that responsibility. I don't pretend to have that responsibility um, or ability to be able to do that. But I can look at someone's support of uh, particular policies or a politician who pushes particular policies that, again, for the Christian, are, are not political, but are rather theological issues, really have nothing to do with our politics, but have to do with what we think about God and his word. And then I do have to question, okay, like what's what's going on here? But the fact of the matter is, is that it seems like from what we've seen, um, what we've seen publicly, I'm not just 
deducing things here, or I'm not trying to dig around for dirt. It seems that he has moved to the left politically. He has embraced a lot of liberation theology from what I've seen publicly. He has embraced a lot of critical race theory. And uh, while that has happened, his theology has changed. There was an interview that he recently did with a guy named DJ Vlad. And I posted these videos, uh, this interview on uh, social media so people could know I'm not just like making this up, but uh, he was asked about um, Chick-fil-A and his involvement uh, with Chick-fil-A, knowing that Chick-fil-A has made statements about the importance of biblical marriages between a man and a woman and supporting the natural nuclear uh, biblical family. And um, he said that uh, he said he never knew about that, that Lecrae didn't know that that was their stance, that he doesn't ask about that kind of thing. He said that that was news to him. And then he he was pressed more on it. Uh, he was pressed more on what he thinks about biblical marriage, what he thinks about sexuality. And he said, look, I, you know, I don't, basically, I don't know. I'm a lifelong learner. I'm trying to look at perspectives. It's very similar to the answer that Lauren Daigle gave. And so this is, these are DJ Vlad interviews there on YouTube. Please go watch it for yourself. I am not trying to put words in his mouth. I am not trying to say that he said something that he didn't say. I'm not making any kind of false accusations. This is all public stuff that you can see his response to the question about what biblical marriage is, the biblical definition of gender, and whether or not he supports that. And he was unable to answer it. And so that is the trajectory that we always see happen. Almost always. I shouldn't say always. Almost always. When you, pre when you accept secular and leftist forms of justice and when you start embracing intersectionality and you embrace critical race theory that almost always seeps into the rest of your theology to where you can't even reaffirm Genesis 1, which says God made them male and female and, and brought them together to be fruitful and multiply. That is almost always what happens. And unfortunately, that is the trajectory that we have seen with this amazing Christian rapping trailblazer who a lot of people look to as a hero in the faith that he is no longer able to confidently answer these very basic theological logical questions. He has also been pretty outspoken about that he doesn't think that we need to be making abortion legal. Now, he does call himself pro-life. He does call himself pro-life, but he also just campaigned for two very radically, not just pro-choice, but pro-abortion candidates. And so he has talked about before, you know, we need to uh, rather than making it illegal, we actually, I went back and forth with him on Twitter on this, then we need to focus on you know, um, taking care of these women so they don't feel like they need to have abortions. We need to focus on health care. We need to focus on, you know, systemic discrimination and racism and things like that. Um, but the thing is, is I told him and I've told you guys so many times, and as this community in Relatable has proven so many times, is that pro-lifers do those things, that we are not just pro-birth, that we give so much of our time and our energy and our money to helping families in crisis and families in need so that they don't feel like they have to, in scare quotes, have to have an abortion. We do resource those people and resource those lives. And what we hear constantly from the left is that because you don't support a welfare state, you are actually just pro-birth and not uh, and not really pro-life. No, I, I take money out of my own pocket to help those people. And so do you guys. It is a myth to say that pro-lifers don't take care of people who are in need. We give so much of what we have, so much of our time to people in need. We are not just campaigning for anti-abortion legislation, which we do, by the way, because we believe in this radical, very fundamental, simple uh, is simple reality that human beings inside the womb are people, that they're humans, and therefore they are deserving of human rights, the most fundamental and basic of which is the right to life as an innocent person. And so, yes, I am anti-abortion when it comes to the law. I am pro-life when it comes to how I spend my time and my resources. But as I've said before, you cannot consider yourself pro-life unless you meet the very basic basic qualification of believing that life inside the womb should be legally protected. Like if you think it should be legal to slaughter a baby inside the womb, you can't turn around to people who think that should be illegal and call them uh, not really pro-life. 
Just because you support, as I've said many times, a politician taking money from people who are richer than you and giving it to people who are poorer than you, that does not make you pro-life, <laughs> especially if you are someone who thinks that uh, a child inside the womb is just a choice. It should be a legal choice. Um, and so unfortunately, publicly, again, I'm not just making deductions and making leaps here. Uh, Lecrae has, uh, he has put himself in that camp of saying, you know, I'm going to vote for the politicians that want to make it as legal and as accessible as possible. Um, but he believes they actually push the policies that reduce abortions, even though, as we've talked about on this podcast, democratic policies do not reduce abortions. There's absolutely no data proving that whatsoever. So, um, some of you have asked me for clarity, like what's going on with Lecrae? I don't know him personally. I have gone back and forth with him on Twitter. He makes the assertion very often publicly, and then he deletes it. I've seen this happen twice, where he says that evangelicals hate him, or people who disagree with him on these social justice issues hate him. I do not hate him. I don't know any evangelical that hates him. I'm sure there are some that uh, proclaiming evangelicals that do. Unfortunately, I get my share of hate mail. Um, but I don't I don't even think all liberals hate me. I don't think all people on the other side of the aisle hate me, quite honestly. Like, I, I'm not arrogant enough to think that they're thinking about me. Like, I don't think that they focus on me enough to even hate me. And I think that Lecrae should realize that the people who disagree with him on these issues just disagree with him. Like, I don't hate him in the slightest. I, I am very uh, thankful for a lot of what he has contributed to the Christian music world. And I think that he's an extremely talented person with a huge platform. I just think he's wrong on some issues. I think he's I think he's veered off course on some issues. And I am not questioning his soul. I, I you know, like I said, I don't have the ability or the desire to do anything like that. But I disagree with him on some really big things that I don't actually believe to be fundamentally political but to actually be theological. And that's, I mean, that's a big deal. And he probably disagrees with me on some things and that's fine. That's fine. But this is someone who is making these statements publicly, who has millions and millions of followers, who has a big influence inside the church. And so I do think it's important for me to talk about things like that and explain why I disagree and why I'm concerned. Um, it doesn't come from a place of hate at all. It comes from a place of of love. Definitely. Like I have, I have no reason at all to hate him or anyone for that matter. And I hope that he realizes that. But it is easier to dismiss criticism when you say that all of your critics just hate you because then you've delegitimized them and you don't have to listen to them. But as long as we do that, we're never going to be able to humbly grow. It might be true that a lot of your critics hate you and they might be wrong, um, but not always, not always. And so um, I think it's important for all of us, not just Lecrae, but for all of us to keep that in mind. Okay, shorter episode today, 45 minutes. We're getting there. I told you guys I'm trying to keep it to 30 minutes, but it's 15 minutes shorter than it was yesterday, which is good. Um, so we're going to keep on working on that. Okay, we're going to be back tomorrow talking about what's happening in Congress today, January 6th. We're going to talk about what's happening in, in Argentina and then I also want to talk about the Ravi Zacharias allegations that a lot of you guys have asked me about, sexual assault allegations, sexual harassment allegations. So we're going to talk about all of that tomorrow as well. I will see you guys then. 